You're listening to the Mens Rea Podcast, and this is the story of Catherine Cooper. In the west of Ireland, where the River Shannon cuts through the country and flows out to the Atlantic Ocean, you'll find Limerick City. It, like most places in Ireland, has a long history of habitation, and the part of the city known as King's Island may have been a population centre as far back as the 2nd century. The combination of sitting at the mouth of a wide open and winding estuary, and near some of the most fertile land in the country, made the location ideal. And it's seen its fair share of history. Oliver Cromwell, as well as the Williamites, laid siege to the city in the late 17th century. It boasts one of the most castly castles I think you can find in Ireland, King John's Castle, which is right on the Shannon, and the city has a beautiful cathedral, St. Mary's, at its centre. Around the cathedral, the centre of the little city is of a beautiful Georgian design, but like most places in Ireland, it's had its ups and downs. You may have read about some of those low points in the particularly dreary but nevertheless interesting memoir by Frank McCourt called Angela's Ashes. Limerick is where Frank and his siblings grew up. The city was a busy port, though, too, particularly in the mid-20th century, given all the good rail links, the good agricultural businesses flourishing, and the well-arranged docks. In the post-World War II era, that part of the city was busy, and with this brought businesses and professionals, and families and the middle class. Semi-detached houses were built, cars were bought, cinemas and dance halls were filled, and the young people had one eye on the latest fashions. There was a lot of development and commerce going on. But down at the docks at Limerick, you'd be forgiven for thinking that you were in a completely different era, before the last war, and maybe even the one before that. The place was dominated by horses and carts, carmen as they were called there. They were the only ones allowed to transport goods from the dock to the railway line. They had defeated attempts for motorised lorries to access the areas, or for the train line to be extended out to meet the ships. Michael Manning was a carman. His father had been a carman too, but he gave up his business and retired out to an acre farm near Castle Connell. When Michael had married in 1952, his father had bought him a horse and cart, and Michael had taken on the business. He'd left school at 15 and had helped his dad transporting goods from the docks to the railway. In 1954, he was 24, and the second eldest of seven surviving children in the Manning family. His family home was in Raybogue, a bit outside the city, near to the Dublin Road. That place was taken over by his younger brother Patrick when their father moved out to his new farm. This was where the cart was stored, near to the field Michael used to house the horse but Michael himself lived in the city centre, on Moore's Place, with his wife, Joan. Her family lived only a few doors down from them. Though the sight of Carmen going through the city was a common one, Michael stood out from the crowd, because he wore an unusual hat. Flat caps were common for workers and labourers, and brimmed hats for professional men. But this was a different beast altogether. It was a Baden-Powell hat, so named after the founder of the Boy Scouts, who used it as part of the Boy Scouts' uniform. It's also the sort of hat worn by Mounties. It was completely unique in the city. As was Manning's horse, which was technically a dapple, but was more of a roan colour with black spots. Michael Manning stood out. Carmen started their work early, in the dim light of winter mornings, and Wednesday the 19th of November was no different. Manning worked that morning bringing coal from the docks down to the railway, and he and his colleagues were finished by half-twelve, dinner time, as they say down country. Manning and another carman, John Burke, decided to go for a drink. Burke was 49, and not terribly close with Manning, but he knew that Michael liked a drink, and that's what John was after, so off they went to Denmark Street and into Bat O'Brien's public house. The two of them shared four rounds, pints of stout. They were joined by a younger man, one the same age of Michael, named Michael Flaherty. He declined to get involved in rounds, but drank with the other two. Burke and Manning finished up at two o'clock, and Flaherty stayed on in the pub. Burke went off home, and Michael headed to his house for his dinner too. Though he wasn't working that afternoon, he still needed the horse and cart, as he had told his dad he'd deliver out a load of concrete and lime to the farm that afternoon. He finished his meal and headed back out at half two, and while he was loading up the bags onto the cart, Michael Flaherty passed by him. Flaherty had missed his bus home, and so he asked Manning to join him for another drink. They went into Kirby's pub and had one or two drinks there, and then Manning said he dropped Flaherty home on his way out to his dad's place. Just before the two reached Flaherty's home in the Fairgreen area, they decided that another drink was in order. They went into the Munster Fair Tavern, where Flaherty was a regular, but the woman behind the bar refused them service, saying that they'd already had enough. When she went to get her mother, the two scarpered, and headed to the nearby Merrick's bar. The two young lads were spotted by a painter, Joseph Dillon. He recalled that the two lads, including the one with the odd hat, were quote-unquote cod-acting, or horsing around, pushing and playing with one another. 
When the two got into Merrick's, the publican didn't notice initially that they were a little worse for the wear, and so served them half a pint of stout each. He refused their second glasses, though. So off they went, leaving the horse and cart as they walked up the road to Ryan's pub. The woman working that afternoon served them two half pints, thinking that they were a bit merry, but not that they were drunk. They only stayed about five minutes, though, before they left, and they messed their way back to Merrick's. By this time, its publican was standing at the door, and when the two lads went to try and enter again, he told them off, and said that they were to get off home. The two hopped on the back of the cart, stopping in the petrol station, and asking for three gallons, laughing, before driving off. The attendant there told the two lads that they'd have to go elsewhere for the kind of petrol that they were looking for. The whole thing was rather merry. Manning seemed to have thought better of the trip out to Green Hill and his father's farm at that point, and said as much to Flaherty. It had started to get dark, and so the cart turned and headed back towards the city. Flaherty initially was going to go home, but decided that he'd head back into the city instead. They got to Upper William Street, and Flaherty headed off, and Manning headed towards his own home. It was about quarter past five in the evening at this stage. But Manning didn't go home. He decided to head to his father's place after all, and so turned around and headed out to the Dublin Road, towards the village of Anacotti. He was spotted a number of times by labourers and farmhands as he trotted quickly towards Green Hill. He dropped the eight bags off with his father, refused tea with them, and then turned heel to head back towards the city. But he got thirsty, and decided to stop into Quilty's pub on the Dublin Road. There he stayed until half eight. Manning was spotted once more on his way back towards Anacotti Village, this time by two young fellows, John McNamara and Eddie Tobin. They were headed up to Anacotti because there were amusements set up there, and they wanted to see the girls who'd come out to pass the evening there too. When they got to the village, they hung around for a bit and bought two bars of chocolate before heading back towards Limerick City. They passed Manning, who was driving his cart quite slowly, before they headed into another shop for more chocolate at about 9pm. When Manning reached Murphy's Field, where he kept his horse, he decided to leave the lot there, even his cart. It was his normal habit to leave the cart at the house, pick up a bike, and then bring the horse to the field. He left the harness on the horse and set off on foot back home towards the city. As he walked, he saw a woman walking ahead of him, dressed nicely, with a striking yellow scarf and beret. Catherine Cooper was 64 years old. She, like many women of her age, had headed to London to train as a nurse, and had returned to Ireland as an experienced and senior nurse just before the outbreak of World War II. In the early 1950s, she was in the position of home sister, and basically spent her time calling out to the homes of the ill and infirm to care for them and monitor their conditions. That evening, she was called out to a retired matron of the hospital that she herself worked for, Barrington's. Miss Curtin had been ill for a week and was bedbound. Given the status of her patient that evening, Sister Cooper had decided to put her best foot forward and dressed for the occasion. She wore a brown tweed skirt with a yellow polo neck sweater and a matching beret and scarf. Over all that, she had a fawn-coloured camel hair coat, very spiffy indeed. She hopped a bus out to Castle Roy to visit the retired sister, just as the Angelus bell rang out across the city at 6pm. Catherine spent about six hours with Miss Curtin, and when she headed out of the house and to the gate, Catherine realised that the evening was quite mild and pleasant for that time of year. She decided that she would walk back into the city. It was about half nine. The Dublin Road was quite a busy place, even after dark in Limerick. It was the main thoroughfare into the city from homes of the well-off professionals who often employed domestic help, so young women would head into town when their work was done and would walk down the Dublin Road. And where there were young women, there were young men. There were also two relatively busy spots on the road, a small grocer shop, which was the first place that the Evening Herald paper could be got during the week when it was delivered down from Dublin, and a mechanic shop, O'Gorman's, where young lads and men who were into motor cars and engines would gather to chat and so on. On that Wednesday evening, John and Anne McCormick were out for an evening stroll, and were walking along the edge of the Dublin Road. As they walked, they spotted two hats lying on the side of the road, a strange man's hat and a yellow beret. Then they saw movement in the nearby field, and spotted what they assumed was a courting couple, until, that is, Anne heard a noise made by a woman that she said sounded like the moaning of a person in agony. The couple decided that they would hurry home and come back with their car to shine the headlights and to try and see what was going on. When they got back, a man jumped up out of the field under the shining of the lights, and in the field they saw a woman lying there, her legs exposed and her clothes in disarray. The man ran off down the road and then jumped over a fence and was off across the fields. The McCormicks didn't get out of their car, but they ought to get a priest, and so drove to a nearby convent, the Little Sisters of Charity, to raise the alarm. Meanwhile, the two young men, who had passed by Manning earlier, were walking back up the road. Tobin and McNamara spotted the hats lying on the ground too, and picked them up. The lads were messing, and walked into O'Gorman's with the hats on their heads. The two lads continued their messing and playing around at the garage for a bit, before both heading off home. When they were in O'Gorman's, they were told that there was a large guard of presence up the road, and then they heard an ambulance heading up the Dublin Road. Eventually, Eddie took charge of the hats, which some of the men had recognised as Manning's. 
They thought that the Yellow Beret must have been Manning's wife's. When Eddie got home, he stuffed the Yellow Beret into the man's hat and left them in an outhouse. The last sighting of Michael Manning was at about a quarter to twelve that night, when he was seen on his bike near Mary's Villas at the railway bridge. He was wearing his overcoat, but not his hat. Meanwhile, Anne and John McCormick arrived back from the convent with two priests, Father O'Regan and the curate at the time, Father Eamon Casey, a man who would eventually become bishop someday and would suffer a particularly public fall from grace. Father O'Regan performed the last rites on the woman, who he confirmed had passed away, and then he, Father Casey, and Mrs. McCormick headed to the Garda station, where they reported what they had found. A Garda and the other three then headed to the hospital, where they picked up Dr. Fitzjames Roach Kelly, who, along with Garda Hannaway, were dropped off at the scene. Anne was then dropped home. The Garda summoned officers from all over the surrounding areas. At the scene, Dr. Roach Kelly said that the woman had died within the last hour. There was a large clump of blood-stained grass next to the woman's head, and another clump, though smaller, on the roadway. There were footprints on the verge that indicated some sort of struggle had taken place there. The woman was lying on her back, in a slight depression, near the grass margin of the road. Her face was bloodied, with blood-stained grass in her mouth. Her upper dentures were found just underneath her head, and her glasses were found nearby, along with a tooth. Her clothes were torn and in disarray, and her underwear was torn into pieces. There was also blood near to her genitals, and a large amount of blood found beneath her buttocks in the grass where she had lain. Her purse was in her left hand, and her umbrella was still looped around her wrist when she was found. The guardie carefully searched the handbag to try and identify the woman. The piece of paper had the name Sister C. Cooper on it. The guarda and the doctor headed out to Barrington Hospital and found someone who would be able to identify the woman as Nurse Catherine Cooper. With a name, the guardie went about reconstructing what Sister Cooper's movements had been that night, and who she had seen. They called out to Miss Curtin's house after midnight and told them only that there had been an accident and foul play was suspected. Miss Curtin and her housekeeper didn't find out that Sister Cooper had been killed until they heard the news on the radio the next day. Catherine's family, who were down near Kalimer in County Clare, were contacted by the Kilrush Gardee and told of their sister's passing. The next morning, her brother Percy made his way to Limerick City. The Gardee began questioning everyone that they met about who had been on the Dublin Road that night and who had seen what. Eventually, this questioning led to Eddie Tobin and John McNamara, who people had seen with the hats that had first been seen lying on the ground next to the murder site. They called to Eddie's house, and he told the Gardee all about what he and his friend had been up to that evening, and about the hats that they had found. He handed over the yellow tam and the distinctive man's hat. Given their inquiries up until that point, and the fact that they now had the very distinctive hat in evidence, the Gardee decided to head up to the home of Michael Manning. They knocked on the door at half past two, and were let in by Michael's pregnant wife, Joan. They headed up to the bedroom where Manning was asleep. Two inspectors, two sergeants, a plainclothes detective, and a uniformed guarda huddled into the room where Michael lay in bed. He shifted around to face them after he woke, and the guardie noted that his hands were dirty. Manning asked what they were there for, and the guardie asked if he had been out on the road that night. When they inspected his hands further, they found that there were traces of blood there, as well as scratches on the back of his left hand. Manning groped around for his pack of cigarettes, and when one of the guardie passed the box to him, he lit up and said to them, quote, I'll tell you all, drink was the cause of it. He gave a written statement in the room with the sergeants and the inspectors present, outlining his movements throughout the day. The other officers went about gathering up the clothing that Manning had worn the day before, which they found to be caked in mud and blood. Manning recalled the various pubs he'd visited on the Wednesday, all the while carting around the cement and lime for his father. He said he'd dropped off the horse and cart, and while walking back to his house, he'd seen the woman walking along the road too. At that point, he said he'd lost control of himself, and he'd pulled the woman into the grass. She fought him, and yelled for him to stop, and he told Gardy that he'd shoved grass into her mouth to make her quiet. He'd pulled at her underwear to get at her, he said, but he told the guardie that he wasn't able to. She went quiet for a time, but then had pled with him to stop. The next thing he knew, the lights of the McCormick's car shone on him, and he ran off. The statement was signed by Michael Manning and the guardie present, and then he was asked to get some clothes on. The guardie watched as he put on his trousers, balancing on one leg to get dressed. They said he seemed completely sober. Sergeant Hanrahan asked him how he was when he got downstairs, and Michael replied that he felt all right. Manning was brought to the station. He was searched there. He had a box of cigarettes with two left, matches and a set of rosary beads. Samples were taken with his permission from under his fingernails, and then at ten to four in the morning, he was put into a cell. Meanwhile, at the scene, photographs were taken and a map was drawn up to record the position of evidence in the case, before Nurse Cooper's body was removed and each item was collected. At half eleven the next morning, Joan Manning visited her husband in the presence of a guarda. Michael told his wife that he had killed the woman. Joan was shocked and asked the guard what the penalty for the crime would be, and if her husband would get bail. The guard explained to her that there was to be a special court hearing soon, but he didn't think that Michael would be let out on bail. Joan turned to her husband and asked, Why didn't you tell me when you came in? Michael didn't answer her. She was in the cell for about five minutes. Michael's father also visited him in the cells. He told his dad that he had quote-unquote done it, 
and that it was quote-unquote all drink. His father said to him that he wasn't drunk at seven the evening before, and then Michael explained that he'd gone to the pub after. He'd seen the woman, attacked her, and then gone home and had a mug of tea before heading to bed. His father replied, quote, I was never up in my life for anything except having no light. I sweated for ye, all my life, for the last fifty years, and now you've disgraced me, end quote. He left his son in the cell after fifteen minutes. The post-mortem on Sister Cooper's body was carried out two days after the attack, in Barrington's hospital, by the state pathologist Dr. Morris Hickey. Catherine's injuries were extensive, and indicated the sheer violence of the attack on her. Five of the seven teeth remaining in her lower jaw were missing. One had been found in the field where she lay, another in her stomach. There were severe lacerations to her mouth and severe bruising to her arms, particularly her right elbow, where a large pool of blood was visible under the skin there. Her fingernails were clipped from her right hand, where the pathologist saw dried blood. She had severe bruising to her head. There were bruises on her legs, just above the knee on the inner thigh. Small, quarter-inch bruises, five in a row, tips of fingers. There was a large gash, found at the back of the opening of the poor woman's vagina, and blood was oozing from it. She had also suffered three broken ribs from being crushed. The pathologist concluded that Sister Cooper had died from shock and asphyxia. The inquest took place on the 20th of November in Barrington's hospital, but the more graphic details of Sister Cooper's injuries were not presented publicly. Catherine's brother and sister had identified her and her belongings, and the guardie told the coroner that they were making an application to adjourn the inquest as a man had been charged with the murder of Catherine Cooper. Welcome to Nordic True Crime. We are a weekly podcast covering a wide range of crimes from Europe's most northern countries. So if you're after a smorgasbord of real crime from the dark and frozen regions of the Nordics, then give us a try. Find us on iTunes or at nordictruecrime.podbean.com, on Twitter and Facebook at Nordic True Crime, or on your podcast provider. And as we say in Sweden... To hand on day. The coroner's report was released to the press, and the details of the violent death, albeit with the most gruesome aspects omitted, added to the fact that a 64 year old nurse had been attacked on her way home, fueled public outrage. On Saturday the 21st, a remand hearing was held for Michael Manning in the Limerick courthouse. Hundreds gathered outside, mainly women, to jeer at him as he arrived for the two minute session there. A path had to be cleared for him to get into the building. The outrage was palpable. At the hearing, evidence was given of the arrest and charge of Manning the day before, to which he responded only, quote, I have nothing to say. Is she dead? End quote. The Garda car also had trouble getting through the crowd on their way back to Limerick Prison. When Sister Cooper's remains were removed from Barrington's hospital, crowds walked with the funeral cortege through the city and to the parish boundary. The funeral itself in Kalimer Parish Church was huge. The Coopers were a prominent family in the area, and Sister Cooper was laid to rest in the ruins of the nave of the 6th century stone church of St. Imey, in a family grave. Due to the amount of Gardaí who'd been called in to help with the investigation, statements were gathered quickly from people who had interacted with Michael Manning that day. They spoke to Michael Flaherty and found out that Manning's drinking had in fact started much earlier than they had initially thought. He told them about how he had met Manning at O'Brien's pub first, where Manning had been drinking with John Burke. Manning had neglected to mention to the guards in his statement that he'd had four pints with Burke in the early afternoon. Manning was also spotted on the Dublin Road by three domestic workers who were on their way back to their posts from the city that night. They saw Michael Manning, and two of them described him as being slouched and watching them as they passed. One was frightened by him, and she said that he followed the three of them for a while. The Gardaí also went about reenacting the movements of key witnesses the night of the murder. The same day as Manning's hearing at the courthouse, John and Anne McCormick traced their walk up the Dublin Road from the murder scene to their house. It was a 10-minute walk, and a three-minute drive back to the scene. Their trip to Milford House, the convent, and back to the scene had taken about 20 minutes. The following Monday, Gardy joined John McNamara and Eddie Tobin, who traced their walk down the Dublin Road to Anacotti and back. The journey to the village had taken them 45 minutes, and they stayed there for about 15 minutes or so. The journey back, where they had found the hats, took about 40 minutes. Then the Gardy walked from Miss Curtin's house to the murder scene, up to the Dublin Road, and past the field, tracing Catherine's footsteps. It would have taken her less than 10 minutes to reach the spot where she was murdered. The journey from Quilty's pub to the field, including unhitching the horse, took the Gardaí about 40 minutes. Manning would have arrived at the field in the murder scene at about 10 past nine that night. 
With the statements and timings that they had, the Gardaí went about trying to figure out where Manning had gone after jumping over the hedge on the Dublin Road and before being spotted near to midnight on his bike in the city. There was about an hour unaccounted for. Manning had family dotted all the way up the Dublin Road, through Ray Bogue and into Anacotti. He was familiar with the whole area. Strange noises were heard by some housekeepers in the area. Mary McCann noted that there was an odd shuffling noise coming from the back of the kitchen area that night, and that the family dog had barked. She said that this was about 10pm, but she didn't investigate further because she was the only one up in the house, and so was effectively on her own. Michael had been seen by his brother that evening too. Paddy Manning and his wife had gone out to a pub that evening. At half ten, Paddy and Catherine left the pub with a friend, Michael Cross, and they collected a horse on their way back to their house in Singland, an area of Limerick adjacent to the south side of the Dublin Road. When he got home, Paddy went to take the tackle off the horse and to put it up for the night. As he did this, Michael Manning appeared beside him. He told the guardie he had no idea where Mickey, as he called him, had come from. Two horses managed to wander out through the gate as Paddy went about his work, and he sent Michael off out after them on his bike, which he had collected from the shed that he kept it in near the house. Michael returned with the horses and said he'd be back for the cart in the morning, and then shot off home. It was after 11, and he wanted to get back. Gardy also questioned his family members about another thing that was of interest to them, the past medical health of the family. They were particularly interested in whether any of Michael's family had been hospitalised for insanity, and whether he might be predisposed to suffer from this sort of ailment too. Unsurprisingly, given that he and both of his parents came from large families, there were indeed members of the family that had suffered with mental ill health. This was noted by the Gardy and filed away for later. They also went about detailing the forensic evidence that was available to them. They took pubic hair samples from Manning when he was first sent to prison, but found that there were no traces of hair that did not belong to him. The pieces of Sister Cooper's underwear were examined, but revealed no trace of semen. Sister Catherine was established to be blood type B, a type only 12% of the population in Ireland shared. The same type of blood was found on the clothing that had been collected from Michael Manning's house the night of the murder. On the 19th of December, Michael Manning gave permission for a blood sample to be collected from him. He had blood type B. The blood on his clothes was definitely not from him. At the time, it was required for depositions to take place in advance of a trial of this magnitude in the district court. This was in order to gather the sworn evidence of witnesses in court before the case proceeded. For big trials, it was not unusual for the public to attend in numbers to hear the evidence that would eventually be used in the trial proper. Not only that, the press were allowed to sit in and to report the evidence that they heard. This was what happened in the Cooper case. The depositions were heard in Limerick District Court by Justice Gleeson in the holiday period immediately after Christmas. On the first day of the hearing, the 29th of December, Colm Condon was barrister for the state and was joined by state solicitor Morris Power. Appearing for Manning was Martin Tynan, a solicitor from the long-established local firm of Tynan & Company. Hundreds of people gathered around the courthouse and filled the courtroom, and once again the Gardaí had to fight their way through the crowds to deliver Manning to the dock, to bring him back to prison, and also to get him in and out of the building when he went to the local Garda station to take his meals. The court sessions lasted the entire day when sitting. On the second day of the hearing, Dr. Morris Hickey gave evidence for three hours. Initially, the judge ordered women out of the courtroom, given the gruesome and intimate details of Catherine's injuries but he eventually cleared the court of everyone bar lawyers and press and warned the press that they might be discreet in their reporting. Not only that, but during an application by Tynan for Manning regarding whether the details of the conversation Manning had had with his wife while he was being held would be admitted, the judge asked that the press not take note of the details of the conversation, quote, in the interest of the accused, end quote. Such was the relationship between the judiciary and the press at the time that they gladly complied with the request. The papers did report on Manning's demeanour throughout the hearing, he sat with his head down and eyes closed most of the time, occasionally gripping the collars of his coat. He did not look at the witnesses, nor did they look at him as they each took the stand to swear their evidence to the court. He was described as haggard and as having black circles around his eyes. His wife and mother were present in the court much of the time, but he did not acknowledge them there. Joan did rush up from the crowd one day as Manning was being escorted from the court and gave him a big hug. At another point during the hearing, as Manning was speaking with his lawyer, she approached and he put his arm around her. The two still appeared to be quite close, despite the circumstances. Much was made of the distinctive hat that Manning wore, and indeed it was the way many of the witnesses were able to identify Manning the day of the murder. The court broke for New Year's Eve, but resumed the next day on the 1st of January for the third and final day of depositions in the Cooper case. Crowds once again surrounded the courthouse. The trial of Michael Manning for the willful murder of Sister Catherine Cooper took place in Dublin on the 16th of February, 1954. The day before, as many as 50 witnesses caught a bus arranged by the prosecution in order that they might give evidence in the trial against Manning. In contrast, there was only one witness that the defence planned to call. Presiding over the case was Mr Justice George Murnahan in the Central Criminal Court, with Mr Healy, Senior Counsel, Brian Walsh, Senior Counsel, and Colm Condon, Barrister, who had acted for the state in the depositions, appearing yet again on behalf of the Attorney General. 
Manning's defense team consisted of Sir John Esmond, who had been both an MP and a doll deputy. Owen Keane assisted, and they were instructed by the solicitor that had been engaged by Manning in Limerick, Martin Tynan. Michael Manning pled not guilty to the charge. Healy opened for the prosecution and described Catherine Cooper, the slight 64-year-old nurse. He told the all-male jury about Sister Cooper's movements that night, and the sightings of Manning and what he had been up to. He described Manning's various visits to pubs throughout the day on his circuitous trip to drop building supplies out to his father's farm. Healy also explained the state that the Gardaí had found Manning in when they had gone to his home that night, that he had blood and scratches on his hands, and that they found blood on his clothes. Blood that matched Sister Cooper's blood type, but not Manning's own. He told the jury that the Gardaí had taken a statement from their suspect at that time, in his home, but he did not go into details about it during his opening statement. Esmond, for the defence, made a submission that the statement taken by the Gardaí that night should be excluded and not presented to the jury. The jury filed out for the application to be heard, but Justice Murnahan let the confession in, and the jury resumed their seats. Each of the state's witnesses took to the stand to tell their part in the story that showed both Catherine Cooper's and Michael Manning's movements and activities that day. John and Anne McCormick both testified about how they had heard the attack, and then discovered the nurse's body when they returned a few minutes later with their car. The court was also told about the detailed Gardaí reconstructions that had taken place, in order to estimate timing. According to these, the McCormicks had discovered the body just after ten o'clock that night. Young Eddie Tobin also gave evidence about his walk up the Dublin Road, and finding the two odd hats sitting on the verge. He described how he and his friend had ended up with them, messing about, and how he had taken them home when he recognised the oddly peaked man's hat as belonging to Michael Manning. The defence put forward by Manning's lawyers was twofold, and was based on the idea that, although their client denied murder, the killing was in fact unlawful. It was more properly described as manslaughter, they said. Both of their arguments were based on the idea that Manning had not formed the required intent, mens rea, to be properly said to have committed murder. Firstly, they argued that Manning, due to genetic predisposition, suffered from a mental abnormality which had limited his ability to control himself that night. To that end, their one and only witness was called. Dr. John G. Kirker was, wait for it, the head of the Electroencephalography Department up in Grange Gorman Mental Hospital. He had performed tests on Michael Manning on the 10th and 11th of February. The test consisted of placing electrodes on a patient's head and recording the electrical activity of the brain over 45 minutes. Dr. Kirker said that there were indeed some abnormalities present in Manning's results. He went on to explain that the same abnormalities were found in about 10% of the population, but were three to four times more likely to be found in people who suffered from epilepsy or people with quote-unquote unstable personalities, whatever that means. The judge then put questions to this expert. He asked the doctor if he was an expert in mental disease, but Dr. Kirker told him that all he did was deal with these sorts of examinations. He was not a psychiatrist. Kirker also went on to concede that anyone might have the same or similar test results as those seen from Manning. Esmond had also cross-examined Michael's father, John Manning, about the family history of mental illness. He told the court about a number of family members on Michael's mother's side who had been hospitalised for mental health problems. The second pillar upon which Esmond was basing his defence of Manning was the fact that Manning had been drinking the day that the murder occurred. He wanted to argue that Manning was so drunk that he didn't know what he was doing and therefore was incapable of forming the intent required to commit murder. But there's a problem with that. Mens rea can be constituted not only by the knowledge of the nature of the action, or actus reus, but also by the accused's recklessness to the nature of the act. Bear in mind as well that legally a person can intend a result from actions without having planned it, wanting it, or having a reason to cause it. Esmond argued that specific intent could not be proven given the amount of drink that his client had taken that day. When Garda Inspector Timothy Griffin gave evidence, Esmond had asked him to describe what state he had found Manning in the night that they'd called to the house. The inspector said that he recalled Manning's eyes being watery, and that he thought the man had definitely been drinking. On the basis of the amount of drink taken by his client, Esmond argued that his client's mind had been clouded that evening by the pints that he'd had during the day, and that therefore he was unable to form the intent that was required to have actually murdered Catherine. Nearly three days of evidence were heard before Justice Murnahan began his summing up. He described how Catherine Cooper had been found on a clear, dry evening in November and had met a violent end. In relation to the defence's argument, stating that specific intent was required to prove murder, Murnahan said, quote, It is not necessary that the accused should have the intention. It is sufficient if he had also used violence, as a result of which the woman died. Drink is no defence in a case of this kind. End quote. The jury would have to satisfy themselves that Manning was so drunk that he had absolutely no idea what he was doing, or that when he had stuffed grass in Catherine Cooper's mouth, that he had no idea that this might eventually cause her death. The judge also pointed out that in Manning's own statement, he told the guardee that he had put the grass in her mouth in order to stop her screaming. 
According to this, he seemed to be, at that time, aware of his own actions. Murnahan instructed the jury that the argument that the defense had made that, due to the alcohol consumed, the charge should be reduced to manslaughter, was not an option for them. He said, quote, Drink is no defense if the effect of drink was really to allow a man to lose control of his passions. The effect of drink had to go much further than to render a man incapable of knowing what he was doing at all. End quote. The jury retired to deliberate at 2.45pm that afternoon, and returned again at half three with question for the judge. They wanted to know, if the accused knew what he was doing when he stuffed grass into Catherine's mouth, could it be presumed that he knew that those actions would lead to death? He told them that, on the question of drink, the jury will have to be satisfied that the accused was so drunk that he was incapable of knowing the consequences of his actions. Two hours later, the jury returned with their verdict. Michael Manning stood up while it was read out, his hands gripping the rail of the dock in front of him. He had been found guilty of murdering Catherine Cooper. Manning replied that he had nothing to say when the verdict was announced. The judge told the jury that he agreed with their verdict, and then donned the black cap to declare the foregone conclusion of a sentence of death. Michael Manning was to be hanged on the 10th of March. Esmond immediately asked for leave to lodge an appeal on the grounds that the judge had wrongfully admitted into evidence the statement that Manning had made to the Gardaí the night of the killing. He said that it was but one of the grounds he intended to appeal on, but Justice Murnahan responded, quote, I decline to give you a certificate, end quote. The trial had reached its end. Esmond and his team went about putting together their case to bring to the Court of Criminal Appeal, and Joan and Michael's friends and family arranged a petition for clemency that would be sent to the government. Signatures also included members of Catherine Cooper's family. It was sent to the government within a week of the sentence being delivered. On Tuesday, the 2nd of March, Manning and his lawyers appeared before a three-judge panel of the Court of Criminal Appeal. There were a number of grounds cited by Esmond and his team as the basis for Manning's appeal. The first was that Manning's statement given to the Gardaí the night of the killing had been admitted as evidence. He argued that the confession was highly prejudicial, given the nature of the charges Manning faced. Secondly, he said that the trial judge had not properly or adequately put the defence's case to the jury in his summing up. He hadn't explained that it was their case that the killing was manslaughter, but if it wasn't, Manning had been quote-unquote inflamed at the time he committed the act. He also complained that this lack of putting the defence argument to the jury was in stark contrast to the full explanation of the facts according to the prosecution, which was given. His final point was that the trial judge had told the jury, or at least given the impression to them, that they could not make a finding of guilty but insane. This, Esmond said, was due to a statement made by Justice Murnahan about the lack of a psychiatric doctor giving evidence in favour of Manning. Each ground put forward by the defence was dismissed. They said that the manner in which the statement had been taken from Manning by police was voluntary and proper, and therefore admissible. The issue of insanity had been addressed properly by the judge at the time. They went further and said that the defence had in fact failed to put forward an argument that Manning was incapable of forming the intent necessary to commit murder. In fact, today the case of the People Attorney General versus Manning is cited as the basis of case law in Ireland outlining that quote-unquote mere drunkenness will not provide a defence to any charge. Lawyers for a defendant would have to therefore show that the accused was so incredibly intoxicated that he or she was unable to form intent at all. The dismissal of the appeal resulted in a new date for the execution being set, April 20th, 1954. The next day, the 3rd of March, government ministers all met to discuss the application for clemency submitted on Michael Manning's behalf. In addition to the petition, they considered a summary of the trial proceedings. They also had access to a report of the medical officer in Mountjoy Prison to consider alongside the assertion that insanity should have been available as a defence for Manning. The report said that the prisoner showed no signs of mental disorder. He had a standard level of education and had no memory problems. He appeared, quote, quite rational in his speech and behaviour. The cabinet came to the decision not to recommend clemency to the president. Michael Manning made a direct appeal in a letter to the Minister for Justice on the 3rd of April, and his wife and mother-in-law went to the Bishop of Limerick to ask him to intervene. The Reverend Patrick O'Neill wrote a short note, entirely in Irish and in old Irish script, stating that he had been asked to draw the minister's attention to the case. The letter was also passed to the President, Sean T. O'Kelly, and to the Taoiseach, Eamon de Valera. Manning was back on the Cabinet's agenda and was discussed once again on the 13th of April. This meeting lasted two hours, but they did not change their minds. The execution was to go ahead on the 20th as planned. Albert Pierpoint was contacted and he made his way over to Dublin from England to prepare for the hanging, which took place on a Tuesday morning at 8am. A small group gathered at the gate of the prison that morning, and women took to their knees to say decades of the rosary. Just after 8, the execution notice was pinned up, announcing Manning's death. He was buried in the grounds of Mountjoy Prison. On the 3rd of June 1954, seven weeks after the hanging of Michael Manning, Joan Manning gave birth to his child. She had returned to live with her mother only a few doors down from the house she had shared with her now-deceased husband. Michael Manning was the last person executed in Ireland. It would be another ten years before the death penalty would be abolished, with the only exceptions being for murder of a member of the Gardaí, prison officers and diplomats. 
It was abolished by statute totally in 1990 and was finally expunged in the 2001 referendum decided by the people. So that's the story of the murder of Catherine Cooper by Michael Manning, the last person to be put to death in Ireland. I have to say it's not a very satisfying note to end that era on, though. I completely agree with the verdict in this case, but it's striking how thin the defense case was. No medical doctors, no testimony from Michael. The murder was horrific and violent, and it would seem totally senseless, but to plead not guilty and then put forward so very little in your defense? It's a little less than satisfying. But that's what we have. Thank you for listening to Mens Rea, a true crime podcast. If you like what you heard, head on over to Apple Podcasts, click on subscribe, and leave a review if you like. Your feedback is what I rely on to make improvements in the podcast, so keep it coming, guys. You can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Mens Rea Pod, or you can get in touch directly on mensreapod at gmail.com. I love hearing from listeners, particularly when it's positive. So don't be shy. Get in touch and tell me what you think, or suggest a case if you have one. This podcast is made with the help of our supporters on Patreon. A big thank you this week to our newest patrons, Stephen Martin, Marie Harris, Molly Gunn, and Carl Phillips. Guys, thank you so much for jumping aboard. Your goodies are on the way out to you. If you like fun podcast merch like stickers and magnets, head over to www.patreon.com forward slash mensreapod and check out the support tiers. There's something for everyone, so do have a look. If that's not your bag, though, you can do a one-time donation through PayPal on the website or grab some merch there, too, if you click on the shop tab on the homepage. It is sweatshirt season, after all. Thanks as well to some of our five-star reviewers over on Apple Podcasts. Thank you to Missy Morzine, Burnsby, Lamtastic, the brilliantly named Big Green Monster Face Dom, and Kellogg's Girl. Thanks so much for your feedback, guys, and your five stars. I really appreciate it, and it really means the world to me. Next time on Mens Rea, we'll be back over to the UK and looking into deaths where a mother's love turned toxic. This podcast is researched, written, and produced by me, your host, Sinead. All sources for today's episode can be found on the website, www.mensreapod.com, or in the show notes, so do check them out. With thanks, as always, to Rona McHugh. Till next time. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. Before nurse, before new, before nurse cur, before nurse cur, before new, before nurse, before nurse Cooper's body was. Re-